Do you ever get the feeling that you've climbed so high that the only way left to go is down? That's how I've been feeling lately, stuck atop some mountain with only a rough downhill path ahead. The view isn't even nice anymore, just fog or dark clouds in every direction I look. It just leaves me feeling lost and sad. It wasn't always like this, or at least not when I had Marianne. I thought she was the best thing to ever happen to me. And maybe she was for a while. Now that she's gone, just when I thought I had finally made it, I find myself back where I started, alone. Losing her wouldn't be so bad if I didn't always end up back on these damn mountains whenever I fall. I initially encountered Mary Ann, though she preferred not to be called Mary, at a fundraiser for wildlife preservation in Seattle early in the spring. At that time, I was a young biologist, relatively attractive, and had recently graduated, working for the National Park System in the northern Cascades of northern Washington State. My expertise lay in bears, and I gave a brief presentation at the fundraiser about the new recovery area project, aimed at facilitating the resurgence of the highly endangered grizzly bear population in the southern 48 states. While they thrived in Alaska, their presence south of Canada was scant. Not everyone embraced the notion of an eight-foot-tall apex predator residing near their backyard, potentially lurking around campsites during hiking, fishing, or skiing trips. However, this environmentally conscious group of potential donors proved to be a receptive and well-off audience, and my supervisor secured substantial funding. I received commendation and accrued some favor, earning a gold star in my personnel file that read, During budget allocations, they tend to favor a competent scientist who also possesses social graces and is willing to occasionally don a suit over a more brilliant but difficult colleague who protests vehemently against engaging with the public. While fieldwork might be the enjoyable part, the true essence of our work lies in garnering public support and the necessary funding behind the scenes to sustain our efforts. The evening brought success on various fronts. I acquired the phone number of an exceptionally appealing young blonde, fresh out of college, studying art history, and already weary of the local social scene. She seemed to view a rugged young field biologist complete with a scruffy beard as an intriguing and romantic character. She possessed qualities that contrasted sharply with mine. She was assertive to the point of aggression, exceedingly wealthy, and thoroughly disinterested in everything and everyone around her largely due to her short attention span. In essence, we had little in common, yet that didn't hinder us from enjoying each other's company for a while, particularly in the bedroom. Initially, it was expected to be a brief and harmless romance. We'd have occasional outings, some fun, and then inevitably part ways as she sought someone else to occupy her time more permanently. However, things didn't unfold that way. Despite my limited visits to Seattle, only once a month, to see her, it oddly suited her schedule perfectly. Somehow, against the odds, our relationship flourished. Mary Ann visited me at the National Park several times that summer. She experienced the public side of things, observing campers engaging in boating, fishing, and hiking activities. I also took her on extensive hikes to show her the areas where I worked, giving her a clear picture of my profession. Collecting bear scat for analysis, tracking GPS-tagged bears to monitor their activities, and studying the behavior of both tagged and untagged bears for our database. From the beginning, it was evident that Mary Ann wasn't accustomed to nature. Her previous experiences had been limited to staying in three-star hotels without amenities like room service or hair dryers. She struggled with hiking, the harsh mountain weather, and the abundance of insects. I hoped that exposing her to the reality of my less glamorous job would dispel any romantic notions she had about it, but it didn't seem to make much of a difference. She still viewed me as a more intelligent version of a park ranger and assumed that, like the bears, I'd have plenty of free time to entertain her once the park closed for the winter. I don't think she ever fully grasped that winter was consistently one of my busiest times of the year. I'd be immersed in processing six months' worth of bear waste, charting nutritional data, cataloging film, and transcribing behavioral observations, not to mention enduring weeks of trekking in harsh winter conditions, scaling icy mountains, 
and meticulously documenting the hibernation sites of every GPS-tagged bear in the entire park. I'll admit, I was somewhat tunnel-visioned, too. I love my job, but her genuine appreciation for it added an extra layer of excitement. Recognition is scarce in my field, so her support and partial comprehension meant a lot to me. It seemed like none of her other affluent friends did anything truly meaningful with their lives. Sure, they donated to trendy eco-causes like the Recovery Project, but I was actually out there, actively making a difference, not just paying lip service. I knew I wouldn't become wealthy, and I was convinced that this was ultimately how her social circle judged success or failure. Despite her romantic ideals, one day she would realize I was a failure in life. I would eventually be labeled a loser in her book, and that sense of failure would become a permanent part of my life, dragging her away. Despite all odds and against everyone's better judgment, Marianne and I tied the knot that August. She had the grand church wedding that probably cost more than my annual salary, yet it wouldn't end her father's discretionary spending. Afterwards, we hosted a more intimate reception in the park for the rangers and park staff. Following that, we embarked on a two-week trip to the Caribbean, where we both suffered from severe sunburns, endured food poisoning, and lost my prized Nikon digital camera to a thief. Despite these mishaps, it was still the most enjoyable time of my life. Unbeknownst to me at the time, Mary Ann was under immense pressure from her family to marry someone anyone. A significant portion of her substantial family trust fund was contingent upon her marrying before the age of 25, a condition set by her conservative aunt who disapproved of unmarried, independent young women. It later became apparent that Mary Ann was still reeling from the departure of her former lover, Dennis, who had left for New York to work at his uncle's commodities trading firm. Only later did I realize that Dennis, not me, was Mary Ann's true love. I merely served as a temporary distraction and safeguarded her inheritance until his potential return. Our honeymoon represented the apex of our marriage. Much like the glaciers on the east side of the park's mountains, where snow fell heavily and the sun rarely appeared, our relationship gradually chilled and moved downhill. I believe Mary Ann expected to socialize with the wives of the park rangers and other seasonal staff while I was away at work for several days at a time. However, she may not have realized that rangers typically marry within their own circles or connect with scientists if they marry at all. Our community tends to consist of unique individuals leading unconventional lives, attracting independent and sometimes introverted employees. The remaining spouses often work full-time at the park or volunteer at visitor centers. People in the wilderness find fulfilling activities to keep themselves occupied. Otherwise, they might succumb to cabin fever. For a period, she attempted some volunteer work, but her commitment was lacking. She didn't attend regularly, only showing up sporadically when she felt particularly bored, which didn't contribute much. I tried taking her with me into the field, but it became bothersome for both of us. She incessantly talked while we were out on the trail, hindering any chance of studying bears, especially since black bears are very wary of people. Camping and roughing it out were not her fort. She struggled with even basic camping tasks like setting up camp or cooking over a fire. In fact, she lacked most domestic skills altogether, even in our own cabin. Then she narrowly escaped a dangerous encounter with Grumpy Gertie, which extinguished any remaining faint appreciation she may have once had for life in the great outdoors. Late autumn poses one of the highest risks for encountering bears, especially older ones. During this time, they frantically search for food before hibernating for the winter. Older bears, often slower and less nourished, become increasingly desperate for a last-minute meal. It's a rare occasion when the typically timid black bear can turn aggressive towards humans, and brown bears, grizzlies, like the perennially ill-tempered old so Jerdy, can become deadly predators. Jerdy had recently given birth to her final litter of cubs this year, and one of the earliest lessons for inexperienced campers is understanding that a mother bear, sow, with cubs, is incredibly dangerous.
Mary Ann and I were in the midst of crossing a small stream when, from the trees and thick brush, two lively cubs emerged, curious about our presence and eager for a drink. I urgently instructed Mary Ann to step back immediately and find a tree to climb on our side of the stream, but she hesitated. Finding the cubs adorable, she might have attempted to approach them if I hadn't firmly stopped her. Any notion she had about grizzly bears being cute vanished when Grumpy Jerdy emerged from the trees, fixing her menacing gaze upon us as she joined her cubs. I possessed a rifle, and legally I could have shot Gertie. She was a well-known threat with a history of trouble. However, her cubs were still too young to fend for themselves in the wilderness, especially without their mother to prepare a den for the winter. I had a few other options, but none were particularly favorable. Mary Ann's panicked screams only escalated the situation, especially when Jerdy began charging toward her faster than most humans. Trying to outrun them isn't effective, especially if you start too late, as Mary Ann did. So I had only one recourse, to intercept Jerdy's path and douse her face thoroughly with bear repellent, a potent pepper spray with added deterrence designed to capture a bear's full attention. I never venture from my cabin without it. It did the trick. Jerdy reacted poorly to the spray, swiping at me with a force that could have been fatal had I still been upright. Instead, I dropped to the ground. Playing dead, the only sensible response when a bear approaches closely. Usually, they lose interest quickly, preferring not to engage unless desperate for food. Jerdy, blinded and in pain from the spray, fled in the opposite direction, howling in anger. Mary Ann never forgave me and seldom ventured far from the safety of the park's living quarters thereafter. It was a harsh and lonely winter, both inside and outside the cabin. By the time spring arrived, our relationship remained frosty, and Mary Ann had spent the long winter mostly drinking and sulking right from the moment she woke up. Despite the poor TV reception in our area, even the new satellite dish barely provided her with any distraction. As early summer approached, she began spending more time back in Seattle, resuming her usual socializing on the cocktail circuit. By autumn, I was lucky to see her three or four days a month, and our intimate life had dwindled to nearly nothing. Just before most of the major roads closed for winter, Mary Ann declared that she wouldn't be spending the winter at the park this year, choosing instead to stay firmly rooted in Seattle. This was the moment I should have faced reality and initiated divorce proceedings. It was painfully clear that our relationship had run its course. She was going to leave me, likely for good. I had become the loser in her eyes, a fate I had always feared would come to pass. It seemed that my luck wasn't about to change for the better any time soon. During that extended winter, I kept myself entertained by tallying how frequently my wife's photograph graced the society section of the Seattle Times. I ceased counting after the fifth occurrence, as in the last three snapshots, she was consistently beside the same individual, a certain Dennis Henry. Never trust a man with two first names, my father used to say, and he was likely correct. At least my wife wasn't depleting much, if any, of my finances. There isn't much to purchase in the Cascades and my government salary pales in comparison to her trust fund income. This left me with ample funds to engage a private investigator in Seattle to monitor my wife while she was away. I harbored no desire to claim any portion of her wealth in a divorce settlement. I simply yearned to ascertain if she was being unfaithful so that I could insist upon a divorce and move on with my life. The uncertainty of waiting in the darkness and snow was the most agonizing sensation I had ever experienced, and by the arrival of spring, my morale had plummeted considerably. I was beginning to feel quite the loser myself. I would have been glad to receive my wife's call in early April informing me of her return had I not already received a comprehensive report from my private investigator outlining her numerous affairs with Dennis who now seemed to be living with her full-time at her luxury condo in Seattle. Despite her claims of love and longing over the phone, her drunken declaration to Dennis in a high-end bar that she wished for my demise, urgently, and as an accident, raised questions. Although she professed a desire to salvage our relationship, her recent activities, 
including extensive research on bears at the library and meetings with bear keepers at the Seattle Zoo, hinted otherwise. These actions, not aimed at preventing bear attacks, involved inquiries on how to provoke such incidents instead. The image forming in my mind from these unsettling bits of information wasn't sitting well with me. My PI had reached a similar conclusion, but the law enforcement agencies we approached basically said they couldn't intervene until Mary Ann made a concrete attempt to harm me. Why did Mary Ann suddenly want me dead, preferably in a freak bear encounter? What was driving her? I was more than ready, even eager, to divorce her on almost any terms. That was the first thing I asked her when she reappeared in my life. Do you want a divorce? I'm ready to give it to you, no fuss or trouble. I won't take a penny of your money. You're clearly not happy in this life, and we're both just making each other miserable. We're both wandering blindly in this mist atop a mountain, where all paths lead downward, some more treacherous than others. Some are so perilous that it's just a matter of time before we tumble straight off a cliff. But there's one path that's relatively safe and straightforward. And it's called divorce. It might not be a joyful path, but it's a stable and secure one that will eventually lead us both back home to start ascending again some other day. That's the path before us now. So, why don't we just take it? The situation was somewhat complex, but I had been tuned into the local country music station all morning, feeling a tad poetic and nostalgic. I was offering her an opportunity for a peaceful separation, devoid of bitterness, legal battles, and hopefully violence. I pleaded with her silently to agree to the settlement and let go of any other plans she might have had for her freedom. For a brief moment, I thought I had persuaded her. She hesitated and deliberated for a while, but ultimately stuck to her predetermined course, attempting to convince me of her love, albeit mostly avoiding direct eye contact. She was a terrible liar, yet I pretended to entertain the idea of reconciliation. We even engaged in intimate relations for the first time in months. It was surprisingly satisfying, but ultimately built on falsehoods. I remained vigilant keeping a close eye on my surroundings and possessions, but it wasn't quite enough. Her exceedingly subtle scheme to end my life came dangerously close to succeeding. I didn't have to wait long for my accident to happen, but it unfolded in an unexpected manner. From my professional knowledge, there was no such thing as a bear attractor, besides the scent of fresh meat. So unless I stumbled upon some bloody steaks in my pack, I figured I could easily avoid that particular problem. Hunting is strictly prohibited in our national park, so I could confidently dismiss the possibility of a hunting accident or being mistakenly shot. Such an occurrence would be highly unusual and would prompt a thorough FBI investigation, a perk of being a government employee. I was primarily concerned about sudden damage to my climbing equipment, as falls from the steep mountains in this area are not uncommon. However, her planned accident for me took an unexpected turn. If you were to compile a list of 100 innocent and useful items for a hiking or skiing trip, it's likely that plain chapstick would make it onto everyone's list. According to some common beliefs in urban legends, bears are attracted to its smell, possibly due to the high beeswax content. On my first day out since Marianne returned, I unexpectedly encountered a record number of bears. This might have been because Mary Ann had generously applied about 200 tubes of chapstick all over my backpack, jacket, and boots, though I couldn't detect any scent myself. Regardless, I unwittingly attracted every black bear within miles. Encountering bears in April was not uncommon, as they emerged from hibernation hungry and forage extensively. Even typically shy black bears become more tolerant of people during this time. These particular bears seemed unusually tolerant of my presence, often approaching much closer than usual. While older bears may have recognized my scent and categorized me as harmless, not worth eating, it appeared that all of them took a special interest in me. Fortunately, despite their curiosity, none attempted to determine if I was edible. I hadn't given it much thought until Grumpy Jerdy tracked me down. In her twisted mind, I was probably labeled as extremely annoying, possibly delicious, and worth investigating soon. 
Jerty caught wind of me and decided today was a good day to settle some old scores. She cornered me not far from my cabin, near a small clearing along a trail with a steep rocky outcrop on one side and a rough nearly vertical slope on the other. I didn't fancy my chances of scrambling down that slope. It would be more like a controlled fall. I figured a good dose of bear repellent might improve Jerdy's disposition. But there was a hitch. My can, which should have been full, was now completely empty. Now it was time to hunker down and hope for the best. My rifle was slung over my shoulder, but there was no time to even consider using it. I curled up into a fetal position, shielding my head and avoiding eye contact with the enraged bear as much as possible. Plain dead usually does the trick, and it did this time too, mostly because there was something enticing about my backpack. It seemed she wanted that as her first course. Jerdy had a lot of fun at first, pounding my motionless body and trying to rip the backpack off my shoulders. I had to move carefully, but I managed to free my hands from the straps just enough for Jerdy to completely rip off my backpack with a few more blows and throw it down a steep, almost sheer slope. Then she was faced with a choice, either eat me or rush after my backpack, but the backpack seemed much more attractive to her, and she rushed after it. My back was slightly scratched, I had a wound on my left hip, and there were bite marks on the back of my arms and on my neck where she tried to wring my neck. But fortunately, the backpack mostly protected me there. I didn't wait for her to return and quickly left before Jerdy showed the slightest desire to follow me. I stopped to take a refreshing bath with ice water to wash off any remaining odors and treat my foot, although I suspected that whatever fragrance was used for labeling, it was mostly on my backpack. I cleaned my shoes clean of dirt, but noticed that my jacket, getting wet, became surprisingly waterproof, so I reluctantly buried it. Everything else seemed to be in decent condition. I slowly hobbled home and didn't see any more bears. I hadn't fully decided how to handle my unfaithful and murderous wife yet, but I concluded that my first step would be to locate a ranger who could then contact either the park police, the county sheriff, or a federal marshal, or all three. Crimes in national parks can become complicated quickly. They say park rangers are never around when you need them, except for lighting illegal fires or hunting in the wrong places. But there was one here and now, waiting in front of my cabin. I had unfortunate news for him, and it seemed he had even worse news for me. While my affectionate wife was pretending to reconcile with me, her lover Dennis, who had come along on this trip for immoral support, had set up camp at the nearest campground by our cabin to wait for her. He was no notice camper and was doing fine until Mary Ann, his lover, arrived at his camp shortly after I left for my daily hike, carrying a bag with about two hundred empty chapstick tubes. She didn't want to discard the evidence here. It would raise suspicion as to why she needed so much lip protection. So she emptied them into a trash bag to take back to Seattle for discreet disposal. She never got the chance. Grumpy Gertie found them first. My memory of the exact sequence of events is a bit fuzzy, but according to the rangers investigating the incident and an FBI team that arrived later in the day, Mary Ann went straight to her lover as soon as I was out of sight of our cabin. They were in Dennis's tent, completely undressed, enthusiastically celebrating what they thought would be their success. Then Jerdy stumbled upon their camp, lured by the scent of chapstick tubes. If they had stayed quiet, they might have been okay. But Marianne, terrified of bears, especially Jerdy, screamed loudly. Jerdy, being mean and perhaps more intelligent than the average bear, recognized Mary Ann's scream and decided to seek revenge and a meal. After satisfying her hunger temporarily, she followed the scent trail to my cabin and eventually tracked me down. Fortunately, there was at least one witness who survived to confirm the important details. Dennis managed to survive the brutal attack, although he was badly mauled and left permanently disabled. His ability to play dead likely saved his life until Jerdy left. Mary Ann, however, bore the brunt of Gertie's rage and hunger, and did not fare as well. Her remains necessitated a closed-casket funeral, a tragic end to her ordeal. 
I found myself officially widowed, and somewhat unexpectedly, I inherited a significant fortune from my late wife's estate. Despite the court's ruling that her death was accidental, occurring while she was attempting to murder me, her family and their team of lawyers disagreed. While I could have fought their claims through endless appeals, they seemed more interested in the money than I was. So to bring peace to my life, I reached a settlement with them. I still received the majority of the estate, which was more money than I could ever spend in my lifetime. With a focus on my scientific endeavors, it would sustain me for years to come. For tax purposes, I established a scientific research foundation, which provides generous grants to me and a few associates each spring. Dennis eventually faced trial for his part in the horrifying ordeal, squarely placing the blame on his deceased partner, Mary Ann. However, the jury didn't sympathize much with the now wheelchair-bound man, as he might have hoped. Nonetheless, he did reveal the elusive motive behind the crime, money. Mary Ann's late aunt strongly opposed divorce, and her estate stipulated that, if Mary Ann divorced within seven years of marriage, she'd lose half her trust fund. Initially willing to wait, Mary Ann changed her mind when Dennis returned early to Seattle. Together, they orchestrated a plan for an unfortunate accident involving me. Dennis received a stiff initial sentence of 20 years to life, but his affluent family's resources and political connections led to numerous appeals, resulting in him serving only about seven years before release. However, justice, as far as I was concerned, was served. Cherty ensured that Dennis would spend the rest of his life in a wheelchair, bearing the scars of his once handsome appearance. I was satisfied. Justice had been served in my eyes. Dennis didn't get to enjoy his newfound freedom for long. He tied the knot with an attractive young blonde from a respectable family, but with limited finances. She was quickly labeled a gold digger, so when Dennis's wheelchair mysteriously ended up in the backyard pool leading to his drowning, society wasn't too surprised. His devastated wife, who had been his caregiver, suddenly found herself wealthier, thanks to his assets and a hefty life insurance payout. Almost immediately, she reunited with an old flame, and they're now living it up on a yacht in Florida. Sometimes karma works swiftly. As for Gertie, her days were numbered, and she had her final meal. While I had intended to handle the hunt myself, that's what rangers are for. Besides, I was still recuperating in the hospital, undergoing observation after receiving numerous stitches. Despite being a clear violation of park rules and regulations, Jerdy somehow ended up adorning my cabin's living room floor as a rug, purportedly classified as an antique on forged paperwork, thus circumventing the Protected Species Act. Though no one owned up to the deed, the guilty expressions on the rangers' faces suggested they were all accomplices. It seemed nobody was particularly fond of Jerdy or Marianne, and most were probably relieved. It's comforting to have supportive friends. I didn't stay a contented widower for too long. The following spring, a new young female biologist with a particular interest in bald eagles joined us, and we immediately hit it off. A year later, I proposed to her a top mount challenger, and she instantly said yes. Now we spend all our time together in the fields, hills, and mountains. Her eyes scan the sky and mind focus on the ground. We make a formidable team. We're both content to live modestly in our wilderness cabin, dedicating ourselves to our biological research. Our faithful dog, Jerdy, keeps us warm company on chilly winter nights when we're not passionately in love. We may not have much, but we have each other, and that's all we need. In fact, we have all the essentials for a fulfilling life. Thanks to everyone who took the time to listen to today's stories. If you enjoyed it, Please consider liking and subscribing if you haven't already. Feel free to share your thoughts on the events in the comments below. Take care.